Hello and welcome to the Complete Physio podcast. Today we are joined by Sam Gidwani um, and we're going to be talking about carpal tunnel syndrome. So Sam, many thanks for joining us. Pleasure. So I'm sure there's lots of people sitting at home because we know it's a very common condition. You mentioned that 5% of people yeah. got carpal tunnel syndrome. I'm sure there's people sitting at home, maybe with their hands tingling as we speak. Um, what is carpal tunnel syndrome? So thanks, Chris. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a condition in which the median nerve, which is one of the main nerves going into the hand, gets compressed under a ligament that bridges the wrist. Okay. So if we were to look at this model, I don't know if you can see that yeah. clearly, but... So that's this part. This is the forearm, yeah. isn't it? So yeah, so this yeah. the finger is pointing towards me, the forearm pointing this way, and there's a tunnel formed at the base of the wrist, base of the hand, with a ligament going over the top, and nine tendons that flex the fingers and thumb, along with one nerve, and that nerve is the median nerve. Yeah. And what patients experience is symptoms of tingling and numbness in the hand when that nerve is being compressed. And in effect, what's happening is that the blood supply to the nerve is being compromised temporarily, usually. Mm -hmm. And the patient feels the tingling and numbness and shakes their hand or moves their hand in some way, and the symptoms settle as the blood supply is restored. And who get, well, as we've said, 5% of the population yeah. get it. So 100 people in the room, yeah. five, five people will get that. It's yeah. a lot. Um, is there certain patient groups that are more common, more likely to get it? Yeah. Well, it is commoner in women than men, and it's commoner as we get older. So it's, while it's such a common condition that it's certainly possible to, to meet a, a chap in his 40s with carpal tunnel syndrome, it's most common in women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, that sort of age group. And what about risk factors? You know, mm. what about occupations like mm. people that are sitting, working on a keyboard all day, or manual workers, um, vibration tools? Yeah. I think there's a bit of a link. It's definitely a link with the use of heavy vibration tools, but there are other predisposing factors. So diabetics get mm. carpal tunnel more often. Then, Anyone, for example, who has a reason for the tendons to become a bit swollen. So patients with conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, where the lining of the tendons can become inflamed, that affects the volume or the space in the carpal tunnel from inside. Yeah. So the nerve suffers from that. Yeah. Um, but the vast majority are what we call idiopathic, which is just a fancy way of <laughs> saying we don't know we why. Don't oh, yeah. Yeah. That's 90%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. idiopathic. Other things, patients with hypothyroidism, so underactive thyroid glands, are more at risk of it. Um, patients in pregnancy or just after giving birth, they can struggle with symptoms. That's quite classic, isn't it? That's quite common. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and uh, th those are the main ones. Sure. Patients who are perhaps a bit overweight as well. Is there a genetic predisposition to these? Not familial links? Not that really, no. I mean, there is a, there is a very uncommon condition where patients are at risk of multiple what are called pressure palsies or nerve compressions. Right. But that's pretty rare. Right, it's sure. Rare. So if somebody's sitting at home now, do you want to just talk through the main symptoms mm. that they would be experiencing if they had carpal yeah. tunnel? Okay. So the classic history, the classic symptoms are of someone waking up at night or first thing in the morning with a sensation of pins and needles or numbness and sometimes painful pins and needles in their fingers. Yeah. And if, if it's a classic case, then it would be the thumb, the index, the middle and part of the ring finger, Yeah, this side of the ring finger that is affected. Yeah. Now, it's very difficult in the middle of the night to observe, ah, it's my thumb and index finger and it's not my little finger. Yeah. But classically, the little finger is spared. Yeah. Okay. And um, again, the classic thing is you wake up in the middle of the night or first thing in the morning and it, it feels uncomfortable and tingly. So the person involved will shake their hand to try and make it settle down and oftentimes it will mm. but then it may come back later yeah and as it gets more intrusive then potentially activities during the day so anything where there's a combination of the hand being elevated and the wrist perhaps being flexed so a classic one would be driving for long distances yes or holding a telephone to your ear those sorts of things can bring on the symptoms I had a lady uh, last week. Yeah. She was did a lot of knitting. Yes, and it always yeah. What well, that that exactly? 
Um, because by elevating the hand, you're reducing the blood supply to yeah. that area anyway. And then the gravity. Yeah, exactly. Why, do we know why we get it more at night? Because that is a classic symptom, yeah. isn't it? So the sense is that when we sleep, a lot of people tend to flex their elbows and wrists. And that flexion posture then puts more pressure on the nerve. Yeah. And so often we will ask people to wear a splint on their wrist at night. Yeah to keep the wrist relatively straight. Yeah. And that can, in early cases, resolve the symptoms. Yeah. That certainly had, and maybe 50%, maybe mm -hmm. a bit less of the ones we see, but we'll do a trial of wearing a night splint for, yeah. say, two to three weeks. Yes. They're not very attractive, but they, sure. you can get them from boots, yeah. can't you? Exactly. You put them on, and it does sometimes help. Yeah. You get a good night's sleep yeah, as exactly. a result of it. So how... so. So how do you, as a doctor, how do you diagnose yeah. this? I mean, it sounds quite straightforward. It's yeah. a cluster of symptoms that yeah. you get, and that's your diagnosis. But So there are the, the patients who fit into the classic carpal tunnel. Yeah. And in addition, if they've gone through a period of splintage and their symptoms have improved, that's additional useful information. Say, okay, well, we splintered the wrist. The symptoms at night were at least temporarily better. Yeah. So that would add to the evidence for it being carpal tunnel. Okay. In other cases, the symptoms are not quite so perfect yeah. and don't quite match the diagnosis so well. So we would then use some special diagnostic tests called electrophysiology or neurophysiology tests, where uh, another colleague, a medical specialist called a neuro neurophysiologist, would assess various properties of nerve conduction and, and how the muscles are reacting to nerve stimulation. Mm -hmm. To assess the you know, to assess the likelihood of the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. Sure. So, does everybody have to have that? It doesn't have to be done in everyone. So, yeah. someone who has the classic findings, no, it doesn't have to be done. No, no. But certainly, in about half of the patients that I see, I would tend to use that. Yes, and I'm sure there's other conditions that mimic yes. these things. So, what as again, when you see a patient, what are the other conditions that you're trying to rule out to prove that it's a carpal tunnel. Yeah. So for a patient presenting with numbness in that side of the hand, carpal tunnel is by far the commonest site of median nerve compression. Yeah. The median nerve can be rarely um, compressed in the forearm. Of course, people can get a problem with the nerves in the, in the, uh, in the neck here. Yeah. But the other main area is where the, where the nerves are exiting from the from the cervical spine, yeah. we call it. So, people with neck pain and arm pain may also get numbness and tingling in the fingers, and so we have to be alive to the possibility that there's a compression in the neck. Yeah. And in some unfortunate patients, there can be compression here and a compression in the hand. Yeah, which will make the symptoms even worse. Right. So, okay. And so you might use, what? what's the role of things like MRI, X-ray? You've talked about nerve conduction studies, yeah. but what about the other things? So, Do they come into play? So I think in a patient where one is not quite sure, is this coming from the neck? Is it coming from the carpal tunnel? Mm -hmm. One could use a combination of the nerve studies I mentioned and an MRI of the neck potentially if there are symptoms at the neck level Yeah, to, to try and tease out where the symptoms are coming from. And then as you said, sometimes it could be that they have a bit of both. Yes, which I assume makes it a little bit yeah, trickier to exactly. to manage. In which situation? In that situation, of course, the carpal tunnel is easier to deal with mm. often than a problem at that at neck level. So I might choose to to deal with that first. Yeah, I'm sure we'll come on to. Yeah, help. we will definitely do that. So that links us in nicely, really. So if you see a patient, um, and the other thing to mention, most of the time there is no reason for this, is there? So they haven't fallen over. They haven't done anything they may you know be under that category of some sort of repetitive strain so lots of keyboard work or you see in musicians as well don't you absolutely um, but most of the time there's no trauma it comes on for no reason yes. um so what would you do with a patient as that first line of de defense in terms of treatment what would you recommend once you thought there is a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome so obviously it will depend to what extent they've already had some treatment yeah so they may have already had splintage yeah but if this, if they haven't and the splint, then the symptoms are really nocturnal, mm -hmm. then that would be a place to start. Yeah. Where either splintage has already been tried 
or is this when you say tried what would you how long would you want them to do it for i said two to three weeks yeah, do you I have think, a no i think that would be sufficient yeah if it's not going to help in a, in a yeah. fortnight then it's not likely to help yeah. after that time yeah um a, an important point about the splints the ones that you get off the shelf mm. um have an aluminium strip in the front of the splint yeah which is contour to slightly push the wrist back yeah which is in some ways just as bad as yeah, yeah. Forward. so the idea is to take that strip out yeah and uh, bend it so that it's straight again yeah, yeah, yeah. and put it back into the that's spot. a really good tip so that, that's yeah. worth, try, worth worth doing just yeah. so that the wrist is actually straight or not i had i did have a patient once when i was in the nhs who got two lollipops yes <laughs> and, put, and put a bandage with two lollipops it seems to say it worked quite well but. yeah so let's say they've tried the split what about things like anti-inflammatories paracetamol painkillers like yeah is there any evidence for this anecdotally or it's tend not to use systemic treatments because, of course, taking anti-inflammatories for a long period of time can yeah. uh, damage the upper, the, the, the stomach. Yeah. And um, it, it's, it's more effective to, to, to deliver an anti-inflammatory direct to the site of the tunnel. Yeah. So we would tend in that situation to use, if the splint hasn't worked, yeah. uh, to use a steroid injection. Yeah. And just talk us through yeah. what that does and yeah. how that works. So. There's probably a bit of thickening of the tendon linings that I mentioned before, even in the idiopathic cases. Yeah. And potentially some thickening of the ligament itself on its undersurface. And a swelling of the nerve as well. Some swelling of the yeah. sheath. Yeah, absolutely. So this, the steroid is a very potent anti-inflammatory and it's delivered through an injection to the space of the carpal tunnel. It doesn't need to be right next to the yeah. nerve. It just needs to be in that space. In fact, if the needle's too close to the nerve, it would be very painful. <laughs> yes, it would. Um, and that's, you know, most often done with ultrasound guidance, which yeah. I think just means that the risk of a nerve injury is minimized. Yeah. So, and you can have more than one nerve, can't you? So you, the median well, nerve exactly. can be split. Can split. I've seen yeah. three median nerves in one yeah, patient. Exactly. So, so, and that's, A, it's very painful if the, if the needle gets the nerve. Which I have done yes. when I was doing these unguided. Yes. And yeah, the patient, because you don't know no. where that nerve is. It's not as in on every patient, it always goes yeah. down the middle between these two tendons. Yes. Um, so yeah, I remember that. But obviously I do the ultrasound guide exactly. now and I'm very pleased that I do. Yes. Um, so I think that works really well. Mm -hmm. And I think the steroid in most patients with mild to moderate symptoms, mm -hmm. so symptoms which are intermittent. Yeah. Uh, a situation in which they haven't developed any weakness. We haven't come on to that. Yeah. that. So, so those sorts of patients, a steroid injection is a very reasonable uh, first step that I routinely use, actually. Yeah. Would you, and this is for my own learning as well, yeah. would you routinely want nerve conduction studies before trying one steroid injection? No, I don't think that's no, necessary. I think if yeah. the diagnosis is suggested clinically, in other words, the way the patient describes their symptoms, what you find on examination, you yeah. haven't talked about examination, yeah, but what you find yeah. on examination, if it all, you know, it comes together as a as, as a coherent story of carpal tunnel syndrome. Yeah, and I think actually a steroid injection under ultrasound yeah. will will help treat the symptoms and in a sense gives you the diagnosis because if it, the patient is better, yeah. then that's likely to be the diagnosis. Yeah, and people will always ask like, well, you know, because generally speaking, a steroid injection for a classic carpal tunnel will give some relief, but it doesn't yeah. always last forever true from your experience how long do these things last and i know it varies mm -hmm. and then the next question naturally was be how many injections can you have so right. and are there any you know, so that you know that? That, that's a, a very good question and i and i think that we probably don't know exactly the answer to mm -hmm. these i mean there are specialists who use steroid injections repeatedly right my experience is that there will be a, a significant percentage of patients, let's say, with the mild to moderate symptoms who are cured with a steroid injection mm. and don't need to come back for the treatment. Yeah. So in that sense, I think it's worth using yeah. because that percentage of patients will avoid potentially having more invasive treatment. Yeah. Um, there will be some patients in whom the symptoms work for, let's say, up to six months and then they start to come back. And that's a judgment call. I mean, to most people, six months is quite a good spell of symptom relief. So they might wish to try a second injection, not unreasonable. Mm -hmm. But I think most people would probably say, if you've had recurrent symptoms more than twice after injections, yeah. you'd be tending to look for more definitive yeah. treatment. And in that sense, 
you know, surgical decompression. Yeah. So let's just go back. You talked yeah. about your clinical assessment. Mm. So if I had carpal tunnel, what what sort of assessment would you do to to help you ascertain whether I've got a diagnosis of carpal tunnel? So you want to ascertain the diagnosis and also the severity. Yeah. So in orthopedics in general, we always start by inspecting mm. uh, and just looking at the hand and comparing it to the other hand. In a patient with, let's say, very long-standing or severe carpal tunnel, you can actually sometimes appreciate some wasting of the muscles at the base of the muscle. So you look at their hands and yes. if they've lost this pad base, yes. you, haven't yeah, they? Exactly. Yeah. So that that's a sign of someone who's had the condition for quite a period of time, usually, mm -hmm. and and at quite a high level. Yeah. In a severe carpal tunnel. Yeah, yeah. And would they felt they're still getting the pins and needles, etc., and the pain? Will they notice a difference in the way they grip things? Yeah. So, I mean, often by that stage, they might just have constant numbness. If it's yeah. yeah. Severe. Uh, and they may notice a difficulty with opposition of the thumb against the fingers. Because the important muscles that base the thumb here, they enable our thumb to, to lift up and away mm. from the palm such that it can then dialogue with the fingers. Right. And, and you know, that's opposable thumbs, of course, is a, a human attribute, yeah. at, attribute that's critical to our success mm, yeah so so in some patients they'll have noticed a difficulty opposing the thumb against the fingers and actually what they'll find is they can't lift the thumb up and so the thumb is sort of crawling uh, along the palm and they can't mm, quite oppose properly yeah, yeah. that's relatively rare fortunately yeah. but um thinking about the more classic moderate symptoms you won't in any wasting of the you don't see anything no do you don't see anything. no no um when they're seeing you in clinic, they may not have any pins and needles at that time. Yeah. So we then use a couple of provocative tests to try and bring on the pins yeah. and needles. So one is called a tunnel sign, where we tap on the site of the median nerve as it enters the hand. Yeah. And to see if that creates the the spray of pins and needles into the fingers that they might experience at night. Yeah. Do you find that is a good test? Sensitive? I'll be honest, I don't find it particularly no, sensitive. No, no. Yeah, yeah. I find... Um, what's known as Phelan's test, more sensitive, where, yeah. the, where the patient flexes their, keeps their wrists flexed for up to a minute yeah. to see if that brings the symptoms on. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there are a number of ways that you can do it. Like That's the classic way. Yeah. You can do it by pressing on the medium Press. nerve and, and, yeah. and a carpal compression test and, yeah. and the flexing the wrist up. I think that's that's better because it avoids irritating the other one of the other. Yeah, and <laughs> irritating your wrist at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Yeah. So, so there, there are a number of uh, test like that that we can use. Yeah. So I just want to bring you yeah. back because we talked. So we, if we break down the function of the nerve, you have sensation. Yes. And you have what we call motor. Correct. So that's more related to your strength or whether something's weak. So you, because the median nerve is a mixed nerve. Yes. You're going to have that sense. You're going to have that pins and needles. Yeah. That numbness and that pain. Yes. And that's common in your mild to moderates. Yes. But what you're saying is that if you've started to see some wasting, yeah. then that's affecting your the motor aspect of Correct. that nerve. Right. How does that relate to what you think's going on in the nerve, maybe the level of compression? Yeah. And how does that does that alter your treatment? Yeah. So if someone has well, there's a, a little extra point to put in there. Someone might have some weakness without having yet developed visible wasting. So they have weakness but no wasting. Yes, because they have weakness and wasting and no pain. Yes. Yeah. So in very long-standing cases, sometimes the pain settles. Yeah, yeah. And the patient is left with just a, a deadness and numbness in the fingers. Yeah. Uh, weakness and wasting the muscle, uh, but not the pins and needles at night. Yeah. And that can be a rather difficult surgical decision to make about whether it's actually worth at that stage. Right. Feeling. Whether it's gone too far. Exactly. Exactly. Which brings us probably onto a good conversation, which we'll come on to about optimal timing of Ooh. surgery, for example. But, but coming back to yeah. your question about, um, you know, uh, what does what does the muscle involvement tell us? Mm. So if, if if the patient has either weakness of that muscle compared to the other side. Yeah. Or the beginnings of wasting, along with very intrusive sensory symptoms, we would immediately think of that as a severe case. Yeah. And that would, uh, you know- More compression, more, what you're yeah, assuming. More chronic compression. Right, yeah. More longstanding compression with damage so that the reason 
that you get these effects on the muscle, the, the sheath of the nerve starts to, ge to degenerate. Right. And, and the nerve actually starts to develop permanent damage that may not that recover. That doesn't sound very good. So exactly. And yeah. that may not recover after surgery, but you want to then intervene quite rapidly. So it mandates a degree of urgency. Yeah. Um, and it also pushes us very much towards surgical treatment rather than trying steroid injection. Would you try a steroid injection? Probably, Probably not. No, because it's mm. it, yeah, it's shot to that stage yeah. where we're worried about the long-term integrity. Yeah. But that doesn't happen in two weeks, does it? This is that chronic compressive. No, no. That could it happen? Very occasionally, you might see someone with an injury or something like that, yeah, where okay. where the weakness and then constant numbness has come on rather quickly. Yeah, but yeah. usually, in the classic situation, no, that's the thing that happens over time. Right. Yeah. Um, so that probably links us on to surgery nicely, mm. doesn't it? And do you want to talk through, in layman's terms, yeah. um, what surgery, because it's a very common, let's be clear, it's, this yes. is a very, very common, Correct. successful yes. operation, isn't it? Yes. How long does it take you to do a carpal tunnel release? So carpal tunnel release is the term. Yeah, carpal tunnel phone. release is the term for the operation. Yeah. Um, and... In general terms, it takes between 10 and 15 minutes to do the actual... Surgery. Under local anaesthetic? Usually under local anaesthetic. Yeah. So, so you're just putting... Are you using nerve blocks or... No, so no. usually what we would do is we would inject... That is, you can see my hand all right there, yeah? You, you, we would inject uh, some fluid, some local anaesthetic into the palm. The ligament mm. that needs to be divided sits across the palm like that. Yeah, so if you stay there, Sam, you stay there and do that. The ligament goes, doesn't it, from this bone to this exactly. bone, so it goes across there. Yeah, yeah. It goes well. In fact, it's got two anchor points. Yeah. So, so like that. Yeah. On either side. So, these two bony bits and there and there. Yeah. So, and that's your tunnel. Yeah. You can see. So that is what needs to be cut. Yes. Or divided. We use divided sounds much um, more uh, sophisticated. <laughs> it's, 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 it's cut. Exactly. <laughs> but, but it's cut. So it's cut. Yeah. Anyway. Um, or incised, if you're... If Very you're, good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we make an incision... Decompress. Decompress, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So we, we make an incision in the, in the skin of the palm yeah. under local anaesthetic. The patient, historically, tend, we tend to use a tourniquet on the arm. Some people prefer not to use a tourniquet, but it's only for 10 to 15 minutes. So that, you know, you yeah. can decide on that. Um, we, we incise the skin, and then there's a layer of fat. Yeah. And then underneath the layer of fat, there's some... What we call the fascia, which is easily divided, and then you see the ligament fibers. Uh, and it's, I mean, on ultrasound, yeah, it's a pretty thick ligament. It's pretty thick, yeah. Right. Well, particularly in patients who have established. Is it generally time. thicker? It is thicker, yes. Yeah. So we, you know, in, in my trauma practice, I'll often have to operate on patients with quite bad wrist injuries, mm. and they mean they may need their carpal tunnel decompressing because of the effect of the injury mm. causing a median nerve problem. Mm. And and we can see the difference that their, their ligament is not so thick. Yeah. yeah. So one always yeah. has to be quite careful to go through it quite care yeah, yeah, and yeah. slowly. So, but yeah, the, the 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 ligament is thickened, and we divide it, and it springs apart, and that leaves enough space. So basically, you've you've got your ligament, you you incise the ligament, yeah. and and it what does it do? It floats. The two, the two ends kind of spring apart. Yeah, and you just leave it. You just leave it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, there are a few important points about the surgery. About the surgery, I don't know to what extent. Well, well no, let's go for it. I'm sure. If I was about to have carpal yes. tunnel surgery, I'd You'd be quite happy yeah. for the detail. So, so the point about this ligament, yeah, is it, it it blends with what we call the forearm fascia. Yeah. So that forearm fascia surrounds the muscles of the forearm, and that's quite a tough structure. So, you know, in doing this operation, we don't only have to cut the lig or in the decompress yeah, yeah, yeah. or divide the ligament. Say cut, it's fine. <laughs> That's what you do. But, but uh, we also have to. So you have to go up the forearm. Up the forearm. Yeah. But we don't tend to make a skin incision all the way up there. No, but you can get your. You can use You can pick the scissors. Yep. So yeah. you can lift the skin up and making sure that the nerves yeah. out of the way just divide that a bit mm -hmm. further. Yeah. But it's an important point that occasionally that's not adequately done. Right. And the patient might actually end up with worse symptoms in the days after the operation. Right. And so should definitely go back to Because the... you're going to get swelling, aren't yes. you, from the operation? And exactly. that swelling is because then compress the nerve yeah. if you haven't done that yeah. adequately. Yeah. What are the risks of this surgery? So the 
I would call this first one not so much a risk as a side effect. Yeah. And that is that the scar here can be rather tender. Yeah. So that's pretty common. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't call it. Because the scar is actually in the hand. It's in it? the hand. Yeah. To the base of the hand. Yeah. yeah. And and so, you know, I say to start my post. Doing press ups and yeah, that. Yeah. If you're pushing yourself up a yeah. chair or something like that. A bit awkward. Yeah. I mean, nowadays, lots of us into our 50s and 60s and 70s go to keep going to the gym. Yeah. Yeah. Like, Fortunately, a dumbbell or a barbell doesn't tend to sit there, yeah, yeah. or or a machine, you know, a handle or machine. But but if you're pushing yourself up from a table or a chair or doing a press up, that could be rather yeah. tender, and that requires some scar massage to soften the scar. Yeah, that's pretty common, but it settles usually. Yeah, there uh, there are very small risks, as with any elective orthopedic surgery, of mm -hmm making the hand worse mm -hmm. so if there were an injury either to the main nerve itself or one of the important branches of the nerve in that region then the patient could end up with more pain mm -hmm. or numbness or something called a neuroma where a, a cut nerve is trying to regrow nice. touch wood that is very very rare yeah. there's also a condition called complex regional pain syndrome which can happen after injury or surgery to an extremity um, again, rare, I would put the risk of that as around 0.5%. Yeah. But it can make the hands stiff and painful yeah. for quite a long time. Yeah. So, so something to be aware of. Mm. Um, otherwise it's usually a pretty well tolerated operation. How long does it take for people to recover? Well, it's always the question, isn't it? The skin heals within about two weeks and yeah. take the stitches out of that stay. Yeah. Um, we can get a little bit of the, uh, the wound slightly coming apart in the superficial surface of the skin, yeah. but it always heals. In the yeah. I didn't mention the risk of infection, but that's very low to yeah. more extent. Um, but there'll be some swelling and discomfort yeah. for a few weeks. And it, you know, so I would say around four to six weeks. And usually people Do you put them in a splint after? Oh, no, no splint. Just a bandage so, for the first two weeks? Yeah, yeah. And then pretty much about three. four to six weeks. So, yeah. I mean, what's the... If you could put a percentage on how many people benefit from this surgery? So I would estimate the success rate at around 95 It's high, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah. What about the recurrency rate? So do you get people that you've, you know, you've been doing it a few years. Yeah. Are you seeing the same people coming back, I suppose, is a good way of doing not, it? Not often. I mean, recurrence is another quoted risk, but it's, again, it's relatively rare. Oh. I think it's more common for patients not to actually get better from the first operation yeah. and need a, a revision surgery. Because it hasn't been, maybe hasn't been done the exactly. best way in yeah. the first place. But that's yeah. probably commoner than a recurrence. But recurrence can happen yeah. because when that when those two ends of the ligament spring apart, actually the, the ligament heals in a lengthened position. Yeah. So if you... As in it, it finds its way back to... Yeah, it's connected to the fascia already. Yeah, it just it just so if you go back in someone's wrist three years later, mm. you wouldn't see a, a, a divided or cut ligament. You would see what looks like an intact ligament. So then, interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So there are times when recurrence happens, and yeah. then we tend to use a longer incision to redo the yeah. surgery. And yeah, I mean, I my practice at Guy's and St Thomas's is a tertiary practice, so I'll see quite a few patients who've maybe not benefited as much as they. Would have wanted and yeah, yeah. To do he has stuff. to read yeah. quite low numbers. That is low numbers. Numbers. Yeah, yeah. But that's the key thing. Is referred it? in obviously is what I'm saying. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So we talked about obviously the people that are surgery is appropriate for. I mean, yeah. often it's the patient that will just. Well, it is the patient that will decide. Is yes it? because they've either can't sleep at night. They're completely fed up with it. Steroid injections have stopped working. Yeah. But then there's also the group where you're thinking as a surgeon. Actually, I think we should do this sooner rather than later. Yes. Because I think that there is weakness and wasting yeah. of this part of it. Yes. Is there some, is there optimal timing? Like what factors, those factors need to be considered, but yeah. do people wait too long and actually you don't get that So we do get resolution. some patients who who have, you know, hung on to or for some reason, I've seen this a few times, they've, ha they've had the, the carpal tunnel. It's been moderately severe and then they've had a fall or something right and it's made it a lot worse quite suddenly yeah okay so you do get patients like that where you want to intervene quickly yeah um or perhaps there hasn't been the appreciation of what's quite going on and they yeah. come and it's it, it, it's really bothering them i mean a lot of people are very stoic you know yeah, yeah. and they'll sort of 
they'll put up with the symptoms of yeah. having to wake up at night. Yeah. But if the, there's the class, there is also the classic severe patient who will describe what we call walking the boards at night, literally having to get out yeah. of bed and walk because they're in so much discomfort. Yeah, no. And you don't have to convince those patients to have surgery. They, right. they, and they actually, you see them in clinic, don't you? Yeah. They're okay, they're okay, but you know their symptoms are quite good. But at night, it's, it's just horrible, yeah. horrific. And no. yeah, it's a bit like we were talking about frozen shoulder earlier. Mm. And um, if you can't sleep at night, it's yeah. one of those factors that really contribute to you swaying towards obviously injections, but then yeah. potentially surgery yeah. as well. Um, in terms of the uh, the wasting, yes, does it? Does the strength come back? Obviously, hopefully the pain's better, and I assume that's the main reason for doing the operation. Yeah. But what happens? Does does it suddenly come back the strength, or if does it not return if it's already gone? So in those in those rare patients who have really quite significant wasting, that won't come back. Yeah. But the aim of the surgery will be to stop the weakness getting worse. Yeah. And um, there's that middle group, as I said, where there's a bit of early weakness. You can sense the difference between the two sides. But it's not got. It's not been there for very long. Yeah. And it's not. Um, uh, there's not. It's not been there for long enough for the the muscles to diminish in size. Yeah. In that patient group, you might well get return of of power. But but in the really established wasting, no, it's not. And do you, you talked about nerve conduction studies. Yeah. Does that influence your decision on surgery? And if so, it's certainly helpful. So I think, you know, we. We do benefit from the expertise of the neurophysiologists, and they will have a grading system. Yeah, um, and actually, that can guide the treatment as well. Mm. So you might see some patients where the symptoms don't see don't seem quite as intrusive. Yeah, as you thought, and they'll come back with a severe compression. Is that ha- happen? Would you could you get that without the wasting? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. You so can, they can have can a severe have a, compression, yes. but because the wasting takes a long, that takes yeah. time to to crop up. So yeah. it's really the intru- how intrusive the symptoms are. So you might actually have no wasting. Yeah, have a nerve conduction study that's showing, oh god, this is this is pretty compressed. Mm. Again, you might then because I'm trying to think about that optimal timing of surgery. That might be that you do push towards surgery yes. at that point because you know it's going to end up wasting. Yeah. yeah, so you actually bring them in a little bit earlier. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I brought, the the wasting thing is important in that it's a marker of someone who's had a chronic severe compression. Yeah. But touch wood is not that common. I mean, no, okay, sure. And we certainly shouldn't be waiting until someone gets a yeah, yeah. loss of muscle bark to say, okay, now you're ready for surgery. Yeah, yeah. My point was, well, where someone turns up and they've already got that, yeah. you know they've had the carpal tunnel for, for a while. Well, we see it. I see it a lot, but they're not necessarily, it. they might be in because they've got first CM. They might have something else. Yes. And I look at their hand. Yes. All right. Well, that's an important point, actually. When someone's got arthritis yeah. in the base of the thumb, which is another common condition in that particular group, yeah, you know, particularly women in their forties, fifties, and sixties, yeah, then you know, it makes it more difficult to assess the bulk, yeah, yeah, because the the subluxation of the joint changes the appearance, yeah, yeah, yeah. of those muscles. Yeah. So, yeah, that's a, that's another thing to take into consideration. But, but I mean, in terms of when to operate, I think. There'll be a group of patients where they've got quite severe intrusive symptoms at night and they just want the definitive treatment. Yeah. And to that extent, surgery is probably better than injections. Yeah. There'll be a group of patients who've had injections where it's come back, mm-hmm. uh, in which case it makes sense to proceed mm-hmm. surgery. And then there'll be patients who clinically and on nerve studies have severe compression yeah. and then I would advise surgical yeah. use. And some of those, uh, group, part of the, that group will have Constant numbness. Yeah. That's another red flag. Okay. That's so a good numbers one. that's there all the time. Or yeah. that's there all the time. So not transient, it's just exactly dead the whole time. That's quite the, the distinction between intermittent pins and needles and yeah. constant numbness is quite important. Yeah. Uh, or they're they're noticing or I test their power and that I find weakness. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's really constant. important. So, so. One question is yeah. do you often get that uh, we see patients that have this on both yeah. sides, yeah. don't we? And does that change anything? From your point of view, uh, it's not uncommon to see patients with bilateral symptoms. Touch wood, usually one will be worse than the other, yeah. and you can decide, you know, which to proceed with first. Yeah, um, it is possible to decompress both at the same time, yeah. but it's very, uh, it can be very difficult to look after yourself if you have to keep both hands dry. Yeah, yeah. So, most of the time, we'll do one and then the other. Yeah, um, 
And uh, yeah, we would just tend to go with the, the more severely affected hand first and, yeah. and give a gap of force. Or if they had a dominant hand, they might that want that one done. Yeah, first. Some, so that depends on the individual. Sometimes yeah. people say, oh, don't, I want to see how it goes with my non-dominant hand first. And then I'll let you operate on the It's the same when you do injections. Yeah. They, they yeah. sometimes want you to go for the dominant. And, then and that's some, patient choice. Yeah. That's absolutely fine. Yeah. I've certainly got, because I do so many yeah. you know, of these injections, um, I've certainly got a group of patients that over the last you know 10 years, they'll turn up every 18 months to two years. And they're like, yeah, it's time for my injections. And and you manage it quite successfully and, and, that and way. That's, and that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I know. Thing, but... It depends on the individual's yeah, yeah. preference and how they respond. But yeah. some people respond incredibly well mm -hmm. to the injections and, and some don't. Yeah. Um, as you know, I use ultrasound a lot. Yeah. So I look at these now. Yes. I'm really interested um, in what actually happens. This is probably more for my interest. Yeah. So apologies at home. But when you look at these nerves. Yes. What do you see in somebody that has carpal tunnel? Uh, I'm assuming they're bigger and, you know. Well, I mean, also on ultrasound, I think you can see swelling of a nerve proximal to the site of compression. You can, yeah. So what you see is yeah. it will be a bit thicker here, sort of above um, quadratus. Yeah. And then when you go into the ligament, you actually, it looks like it's squashed. Yeah. Um, so you can see that deformity sometimes in a very good going case. Mm. You can also appreciate after releasing the nerve, particularly if you then let the tourniquet down, or if you haven't had a tourniquet up, which is also possible, to you can see a blush in the nerve. You can see a change in color in the nerve where it's become, the term is hyperemic, in other words, more blood has come to that area, yeah, yeah. which has been, to some extent, starved of blood you liar. for a period. Yeah. Uh, and so you can see that change after the release. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can appreciate the thickened ligament. You can appreciate sometimes what we call tenosynovitis and inflammation around the tendons. So there are a number of things that you can see, yeah. but quite often you don't see that much. Yeah, really. And we've You're, talked. We, sorry, yeah, we yeah, also we also look just to make sure there's no underlying uh, lump or ganglion or something. Well, I was just push, about push, to yes, come on to that okay. because I sent you that case, yes. which you were absolutely brilliant with. I remember calling you and you're on holiday. Yeah, you still sorted it out. Um, we had that lady yes. that um, had a cyst. Yes, yes. Do you remember? Yeah. And, and we've talked as if every carpal tunnel is the same, but you do get occasions where you actually need to find out. And most people, as you say, they get carpal tunnel, the nerves compress, but sometimes there's something else yes. compressing the nerve, yeah. a swelling, a ganglion, dare I say it, a tumour. Oh. Um, the tendons can do that as well. Yeah, so those, yeah. those could be a bit trickier, I see. Yeah, yeah I mean... Fortunately, the effect of dividing the ligament is usually sufficient to allow the, the sort of secondary effect of that swelling to be mm -hmm. mitigated. Yeah. Right? But uh, it's it's worth looking to see if mm -hmm. there's anything under there that might be causing an extrinsic compression yeah, yeah. Uh, into the carpal tunnel. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, I think we've covered yeah. everything. Maybe one other thing. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah no, no. It, in some patients... It, we can consider doing something called an endoscopic carpal tunnel release. So, very interesting. Yes. Yeah, so this is not uh, necessarily it's not necessary routinely, but for patients where the scar tenderness is likely to be an issue, so particularly patients working with their hands. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can do a decompression from within out. So yeah. That means making an incision in the softer skin. Yeah. In the forearm, and using. An, an, an endoscope, which is a, if you like, a telescope that you insert into the tunnel. Mm. And this has a little blade attached to it, which we can elevate by pressing a trigger on the, on the uh, scope mm. and then release the, the tendon, or release the uh, ligament from underneath. So that is so the, There's a camera. There's a camera. So you're looking at a TV screen. Yeah. And you've got your scope inside the carpal tunnel underneath the ligament. Yeah. Then you find, make sure that the nerve is out of the way, yeah. obviously. And then you can see the transverse fibers of the ligament where, they cr where they're crossing over yeah. on your TV screen. Yeah. You see the end of it, lift the blade up, and then pull backwards. See, I mean, that sounds brilliant. Why are, like, I, I, my gut feeling to that is why, why aren't we, we doing all of them like yeah. that? Because what I can say is they do get that hard scar. Yeah. And everybody at some point is yeah. pushing through that. It would make so much sense to have it somewhere where you're never going to wait there. Yeah. So it's... 
I think the thing with style was it needs it, I don't do that under local anesthetic and most people don't do that under local anesthetic. Okay, well so that's, that's quite key, that's isn't the, it? That's the difference. So because injecting local anesthetic into the tissues there can affect the clarity of the view you get with your scope. Yeah. yeah. I would tend to do that under either or something called a regional anesthetic yeah. or a, a quick general anesthetic. Yeah. So that is a one difference. Yeah. Um and and the other thing is that the scar tenderness, I mean I it is common. By and large, it settles. And also, if you think about how many, I don't know, hundred thousands of these are done, yes. generally speaking, yeah. it's very successful. Yes. So people don't have any problem with the scar. Correct. But I think your point about, you know, I'm thinking about sportsmen yes. or musicians, that, that actually is exactly yeah. where they hold the yeah. violin or whatever. Yes. I, I don't play the violin. Yeah. I have no idea where you hold a violin. Yeah. But I can imagine that would be quite reassuring if they've got another option. Yeah, potentially. Totally. You know, and I've had, uh, I can think uh, both... Here at London Bridge and in um, other practices at Guy's and so forth, a few, yeah, quite a few patients who had particular reasons. I remember one patient who had bilateral carpal tunnel, and she was a wheelchair user, no, a, a young woman, yeah, yeah, yeah. who needed it. And and so you know, having to pro self propel a wheelchair, yeah. it was very appealing to do that. That's a really nice option. It, yeah. Is that so? I mean, you obviously do it. Um, lots of people doing this, or is that? I, 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 definitely, I have colleagues who do it. Yeah. I'm not the only person who no, does no, it no. in the UK. It's much commoner, much more commonly used um, in, for example, Australia, which is one of the places I train. So that's, yeah. that's why I picked it up. But I think it's much commoner in Australia and, and the States than in the Far East than it is yeah, here. Yeah. Not sure about Europe. Sure. Um, but then I certainly have other colleagues who would do it, but it's probably the minority. Yeah, yeah. It's a nice option to have yeah. with those patients. Exactly. Particularly. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Sam. Pleasure. Thank you.